everything in it. That's your story. You may go back to your seats. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. And thank you, Dave. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for everyone that's done their part. Please pray with me, if you would. Father in heaven, Lord, I ask that uh, you come and speak to us and uh, teach us the lessons you want us to know, want us to learn. I pray that you would be honored. I pray that your name would be praised. Give us receptive hearts and ears to listen and to apply it to our own lives, we pray. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know if many of you uh, recognize those couple of verses that Dan read for the, children, or f for the scripture reading as the end of a story, a rather sad story in scripture. And I figured you probably knew it well enough, so I would give you just a little bit of an introduction that way. We're going to spend a little more time on it here in the next uh, 20 minutes or so. As you know, not every... Not every uh, part of the scripture as it's first presented, as it's first read, perhaps seems uplifting. Um, at least not morally uplifting. And if you're like me, you probably ask yourself, why would God have put that in there? Why did God inspire a writer to, to record that part? What, what possible good is it? Uh, this morning we're going to take a look at one of those stories. And I believe there's some very important lessons for us to learn and that we can learn. And so I'd invite you, if you would, please turn in your scriptures to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11. And if you haven't guessed it yet, yet, it's about David and Bathsheba and Uriah and that story. 2 Samuel chapter 11. By the way, I spot some faces I don't recognize and just like to invite you or welcome you here today. We're delighted you're here uh, and just feel, feel at home. This is your uh, house of worship today just like it's ours and we're here to worship God. So again, we're glad you're here. Please stand, please stay for dinner afterwards as well. There's always plenty. Second Samuel chapter 11. And I'm going to read, and I might throw in a comment or two, so keep watching so you don't get a leg pulled out from any of you, okay? I've been known to do that. <clears throat> it came to pass in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle. I highlighted that because that's kind of an important detail. That David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon, and they besieged Raboth. But David remained in Jerusalem. I highlighted that as well. We'll come back to that in a little bit. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked to the roof, or walked on the roof of the king's house. Now, typically, a, a city at that time was built in a side hill, and so some of the buildings, and perhaps the palace or the king's house, was a little higher. And so, if he's going to walk on his roof, he could overlook several houses or the, the city. And as he looked over his city that evening. He spotted a woman taking a bath on her roof. Says that the woman is very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman. Someone said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Now David was married, A, already. He was already married. In fact, he had more than one wife. I'd have to double check how many he had, but he had multiple wives at this point. 
The fact that someone knew that this was a wife of someone else should have been a red flag for David, if there hadn't been some red flags already. Back to our story. Then David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. And the woman conceived, so she sent and told David and said, I'm with child. Well, David put his thinking cap on. So verse 6, he said, David sent to Joab, Joab would be the commander, saying, send me Uriah the Hittite. Joab sent Uriah to David. By the way, Uriah, it's, he's always referred to as Uriah the Hittite. He was from another background, another, uh, in other words, perhaps, perhaps the Hittites had been conquered or whatever, but Uriah had joined forces. In fact, Uriah had joined faiths, the same faith as David, but he wasn't raised that way. And uh, to me, it adds some character to the story, or perhaps some sadness to the story. When verse 7, when Uriah had come to him, David asked how Joab was doing, and how the people were doing, how the war prospered. And David said to Uriah, go down to your house, wash your feet. Uriah departed from the king's house, and a gift of food from the king followed him. Verse 9 says, Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of the Lord and did not go down to his house. So when they, the, the servants told David, saying, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, did, not, did you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, and before we get that far, no, no, let's, let's continue. Verse 11, Uriah said to David, look. <coughs> he didn't say look, but this is what Uriah is thinking. The ark, <coughs> the ark and Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents. My Lord Joab and the servants of my Lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go to my house and eat and drink and lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. See, David had sent Uriah thinking he'll come home spend some time at home with the family. Later on, as they figure out that they're expecting, they'll just assume they're having a full-term premature baby. In other words, you don't think that one through, but that would be naturally have been Uriah's baby that uh, Bathsheba has, covering up the pregnancy that David had caused. That's what's supposed to be happening. So David has put together this scheme to make it happen. So we see the character or what's happened in David's life, and we also at the same time see the character of Uriah the Hittite. Certainly Uriah was a very faithful soldier and a man of character. So then David said to Uriah, okay, wait around another day. Tomorrow I'll let you depart. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. So now look at verse 13. When David called him, he ate and drank before him, and he made him drunk. Figured, okay, this will help. Get him a little tipsy. He won't be quite as, you know, take away the inhibitions. He's probably going to go home. At the evening, he went to lie in his bed with the servants of the Lord, but he did not go down to his house. It gets worse. Then in the morning, it was so that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And as we'll see, this was Uriah's own death warrant. You see, David's next plan was, well, if we can't get Uriah to spend some time with his wife, then I need to make sure this is covered up permanently. So now is a plan to eliminate Uriah from, uh, from the population. He wrote a letter to Joab, sent with Uriah, and the letter said, send or set Uriah at the forefront of the hottest battle and then retreat from him that he may be struck down and die. So it happened while Joab besieged the city, he assigned Uriah to a place where he knew there would be valiant men. And the men of the city came out and fought with Joab and some of the people of the servants of David fell. Uriah the Hittite died also. Verse 18, then Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war. 
he sent a messenger back to David. Let's review what's happened so far. David has had an affair. He then set out to cover the affair by deception. Then when that didn't work out, he made arrangements for Bathsheba's husband to be killed so that he would never discover. In the process, Uriah is killed as well as some other collateral damage. There are other people killed as well. Let's move up to verse 22. The messenger comes. So the messenger went and came and told David all that Joab had sent by him. The messenger said to David, Surely the men prevailed against us and came out against us in the field, and we, we drove them back as far as the entrance of the gate. But then the archers shot from the wall at your servants, and some of the king's servants are dead. Your servant Uriah the Hittite is also dead. Obviously Uriah was a very valiant soldier and well-known in their army. Note Dave's sympathy, or David's sympathy. Then David said to the messenger, Thus you shall say to Joab, Don't let this thing displease you. In other words, what happens, happens. The sword devours one as well as another. Strengthen your attack against the city and overthrow it. So encourage him. Not a whole lot of sympathy. In fact, David has grown pretty hard-hearted. And in verse 26 and 27, what we read earlier is the scripture reading for the day. Then the wife, when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, was, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. It seemed like everything was settled. David was thinking he had pulled off a past one. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Somebody knew about it. Let's take a little, analyze this a little bit. And we'll be coming back to our story in a little bit. The question is, what lessons can we learn from this very sad chapter in David's life? Another question might be, how did this ever happen in, in David's life? I mean, David, this man of God? Or more important, how do I make sure that something like this doesn't happen in my life? And I think it's relevant for us today. In fact, I'd like to share a couple of texts. Now, I, I wrote down all my texts, but I would invite you to just jot down in your notes. If you want to follow along from Scripture, please do. If you're a fast turner, my fingers are a little slower than they used to be. But 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11 tells us that all these things were written, or they happened to them as examples. And they are written for our admonition, or in other words, our warning, or our attention. Maybe uh, to wake us up. Upon who the ends of the ages have come. And I believe that's talking about you and I today. I think we're close to the end of the ages, are we not? Verse 12 says, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. How do we take heed? I've got four points, and I, these four points aren't original with me, but I heard them one day on the radio, and I thought, that's pretty good thinking. And then I added some things to them. So I can't take full credit. But I think it's very relevant, and I like to throw them out. And again, you may want to jot these down. Number one, how do we take heed? To acknowledge our vulnerability. That's, that's too big for me to think of. But to acknowledge the point of fact that maybe we are vulnerable as well. Don't ever tell yourself, it could never happen to me. You know, a young missionary was confiding in a very godly older gentleman who had been a mentor to him. He was talking about some personal issues, personal struggles. And then the young missionary asked this older gentleman, how old were you when you finally gained victory over lust? Well, the 86-year-old gentleman replied, he thought about it and he said, hopefully when I'm 87. In other words, it's still a struggle in my life. 
The struggles in our life continue with us as long as we have breath, do they not? But seriously, David was a mighty, fearless leader. A man, I mean, you look up the chapters before 2 Samuel 11 and you see David having victory after victory after victory after victory. God was blessing him big time. He was a man who trusted God, a man of principle, a man after God's own heart. So let's bring him a little bit closer to our level into today. You see, like us, David with us was a Sabbath keeping, Ten Commandment loving, Advent anticipating, spirit filled man who loved the Lord. That was David. Again, acknowledge your vulnerability. If it happened to David, it could happen to us. Number two, guard your leisure. Put your finger back there in 2 Samuel 11 again, if you remember. While David, no, let me go up one. While you're looking for that, 2 Samuel 11, verse 1 and 2. You know, there's an old saying, and it's not something that's in the Bible, but the principle is, definitely goes through Scripture. Idle hands are the devil's workshop. And 1 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1 and 2 talked about that it happened in the, in the spring when, of the year when, when, when kings go out to battle, that David stayed home. And here is this leader who had led Israel through victory after victory after victory. If there's anyone that should have been out there, it should have been David. But David decided to stay home. And then he had some extra time, so one night he's out on his roof, and then he sees something. You know, if he'd been busy, he probably wouldn't have been there in the first place. And it's one thing to take one look. All of us see things at times we should never see. But it's when you take that second look, is it not? There's something to be said for hard work and keeping busy. They say a farm is a good place to raise kids, and sometimes that helps. We find an example of this back in Genesis chapter 3 when Adam and Eve fell. Genesis chapter 3, 17, and if you take a moment, just look at there, because it's pretty easy to find, right? The first few chapters of the Bible. When God was announcing some of the consequences of their fall, then to Adam he said, and I'm going to just scroll down a little bit there, partway down in verse 17, halfway down, curses the ground, and what does it say? For your sake. It's not just a punishment, it's for your own good. Sometimes keeping us busy and struggling, whatever, it keeps us a little more connected with God. Less time to get in trouble. So guard your leisure. Number three, maintain accountability. Again, these are too deep for me to have thought of, so I gotta give credit also. But maintain your credibility or, or accountability. And sometimes that may take the shape of a, of, of, of a trusted friend. Maybe you struggle in a certain area of your life with this moral issue or that, and sometimes having someone, you know, a, a close friend that you can confide with and, and check up on each other and support each other with prayer. Sometimes maybe that's a spouse. You know, all of us have seen the, the cartoon, perhaps, of, of the husband who sees something he shouldn't, takes a second look, and his wife is there with a frying pan, gong over the head. And we, we laugh, but the principle is, 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 is an all right principle, all right? So maintain accountability by having someone that helps watch with you. Another point that I think to maintain accountability is to fill your mind with scripture. I'll give you a few. Most of these who recognize, thy word I have hidden in my heart that I may not sin against thee. Psalm 119, verse 11. How about Psalm 101, verse 3? I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. 
Or Philippians 4, verse 8, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things is of good report. If there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. See, we should regularly ask ourselves, am I applying these principles of these scriptures and others as well? To my daily life. How about are we applying it in the things I read or the music we listen to or your internet time or your television shows, your movies, your recreation or whatever else we allow our minds to dwell upon? What if David had been applying those things in his life that night, even if he had been home but been meditating on God's word? I wonder if the results would have been the same. I think not. Here's one I mentioned in Sabbath school this morning. <clears throat> you hear this text perhaps at Christmas time, Luke chapter 2, verse 49. It's kind of the end of that story about when Jesus was 12 years old. And his parents, let me find that myself. Luke 12, 49. I invite you to take a look at that. And again, I invite you to be uh, like a Brian Baptist this morning and make sure I'm telling it to you straight. The Brians in Scripture, you know, accepted what was taught, but then they went home and studied for themselves, made sure. Luke 2, verse 49. Remember, his parents had brought them for Passover, or brought Jesus for Passover. And then they'd gone back, and they just assumed Jesus was somewhere in the crowd, maybe visiting with some friends, and they went a full day's journey and discovered that Jesus was not with them. And then they panicked and turned back, ran back to Jerusalem two days before they found him, and then they found him teaching in the temple. And his mother said to him, where in the world have you been? <laughs> Your father and I sought you anxiously. And Jesus replied, was it, why was it that you sought me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Now again, yes, he was talking about doing something specifically. But what about if we, in every day, every moment in our life, whether we're teaching 16 students on Monday whether we are grocery shopping, whether we are feeding the baby, whether we are treating a DA, right, Calvin? Whether it's a church social, whether it's finding a spot in the parking lot. What if every moment of every day we thought, am I doing my father's business? Because that's what I want to do. Would our lives be different? And is that not our job? Yes, we're called to maintain our accountability. Number four, we should, if we've made it through those three and we're still debating, I think we should rehearse the consequences. What do you mean? Well, I wanted to turn back to 2 Samuel. This time we're going to go to chapter 12. Remember at the end of what was read before, David thought he had pulled a past one. But God wasn't impressed. <coughs> So I invite you to turn to chapter 12, the next chapter. We're going to go through that real quick and look at the lessons. Note the first part of that sentence. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David. Who sent who? The Lord sent Nathan. Who sought out who? The Lord sent for David. The Lord's always seeking to save the lost, is he not? 
And the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said to him, and Nathan told him the story. It's interesting that story is about sheep, and David knew sheep. There were two men in one city, one rich and another poor, and the rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the floor man, poor man had nothing except for one little ewe lamb that had, he had bought and nourished and had grew up together with him and with his children. He ate his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom. It was like a daughter to him. And then a traveler come along to the rich man who refused to take one of his own flock from his own herd to prepare for the wayfaring man who had come to him. Instead, he took the poor man's lamb, prepared it for the man who had come to him. Look at David's response. David is a man of character. Then David's anger was greatly aroused against the man, and he said, he says to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely be put to death. It's only right. And he shall restore fourfold to the lamb because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan looked at David and said, David, you're the man. You're the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel. Now note these next few verses. This is what God says to David. I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you from the hands of Saul. I gave you your master's house. I gave you your master's wives in your keeping. I gave you the house of Israel. I gave you the house of Judah. And if that had not been enough, if that had been too little, I also would have given you much, much more. How easy it is to forget what God has done for us, is it not? And then when we forget, that's when we get in trouble. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? And it gets specific. You've killed Uriah the Hittite. Imagine David's jaw dropping about right then. How did you know? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife. You have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up, an adversi I will raise up adversity against you from your own house. I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel, before the sun. And David says, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. But note verse 14 as well. This isn't just a Cheap grace. There's always consequences. Because this deed has because of this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. Sometimes a bad example is worse than no example at all. And God's enemies just mock. We'll come back to that in a little bit. You see, rehearse the consequences. What if David had thought through the possible consequences of his actions before he acted that night? You know, sin promises freedom, but it always enslaves, every time. It offers fulfillment, but it always leaves us empty. There's guilt, there's shame, and then there's collateral damage. In this particular story, eventually they lose their child. Uriah is killed. Other servants of David are killed. All because of the things that started as just a thought in David's mind. Or maybe I should say because he didn't think. There's broken relationships. There's broken families. Romans 6, 23 says, The wages of sin is death. 
I used to think that was just a rule that God decided because God was bigger than everyone else. And I was okay with that because God is bigger than everyone else. But I think that's just a statement from God. God is saying, sin destroys. Sin tears apart. Sin ruins every time. God hates sin because it ruins people. It ruins lives. And ultimately, God's character suffers in the process. So to review, how do we take heed? We acknowledge our vulnerability. We guard our leisure. We remain accountable and rehearse the consequences. But there's more to this story. See, it always, even the sad stories in scripture have good endings, at least most of the time. There's a good ending here. Oh, not that David wouldn't have changed some things if he couldn't. I'd invite you to take a look a little further. Verse 13 said, Samuel, or Nathan announced it. Uh, I'll stop talking and start reading. And David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. As I said, this was not just a cheap and easy cover-up. There were some real consequences that David had to live with the rest of his life. So, some major consequences. And his nation suffered. It was never the same. It messed up his family big time. Not that you can say, well, because you know, my son did this, or my grandson did this, you know, it's, it's my fault. But it, it takes its toll. It takes its toll. On the other hand, and I invite you to turn with me to Psalm 32. Psalm 30, verse, chapter 32, I'm sorry. There's a couple of Psalms in particular, Psalm 32 and Psalm 51, that are most scholars believe were a direct inspiration from David's life, especially his sin with Bathsheba. In this affair. So, Psalm chapter 32. You see, David could live with the consequences as hurtful and as sad and as tough as they were of the damage he had done. But he couldn't live with the guilt inside. He just couldn't live with that. Psalm 32, 1 through 5 says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no guile. When I kept silent, and as I read this, I'm thinking this is David for that year or whatever time period between his decision and the affair with Bathsheba and when the child was born before Nathan showed up at his door one day. He said, when I kept silent, when I kept this secret, my bones grew old. Through my groaning all the day long, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledge my sin to you, and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Now verse 7. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. Verse 10, many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. Verse 11, be glad and rejoice. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous. And shout for joy, all you upright in heart. See, in spite of David's past, he could count himself with the righteous, not because of some merit of his own, but because of the mercy of God. 
Proverbs 28, 13 says, He who covers his sin will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. You know, many of us If not all of us can relate in some way or another to this story today. Oh, not, not everyone's had an affair, not everyone has done this or that. But all of us have struggles, maybe done some things we wished we'd never, never allowed our mind to even take a second look at. <clears throat> you know, we live in a broken world. And our bumps and bruises from our own mistakes is something we live with. Perhaps there is someone listening today with some struggle, some sin, and maybe on the outside you look okay, but inside you feel rotten to the core like David did. You know, maybe, maybe because it's not known, the enemies of the Lord are, aren't mocking God, but you know as well as I do that when you're feeling that way and you have guilt inside, that your ministry or your, out, or your, your, your influence for good to other people is, is at best crippled. You know, you're, as the mechanic says, you're, you're hitting on five out of eight, and those five are weak. You know. In a special way today, as I look at these verses, I want to offer to you their forgiveness, and cleansing, restoration that Jesus Christ longs to give to you today. I invite you to pray with me. I'm praying from Psalm 51, some of my favorite verses. Verse 10 through 12, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with your free spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.